Hello, friends. I am here today on December the 12th, reminiscing about some wonderful things. I am Monty Alexander, and I want to share with you some true adventures in my life. Here I am in my apartment, and I conjured up a few memories around me. I'm taking off my Jamaica flag. That's where I'm from, Kingston, Jamaica. And in Jamaica, I got to have me some Jamaican establish a fact here. There's a newer Jamaica than the one I grew up in. A wonderful, two different wonderful Jamaicas. The first one was this one, which was kind of influenced by the colonial British occupation. I won't call it that. But we had the influence of a lot of English, British experiences. I went to a school where it was a, a preparatory school. It taught me how to behave and not to be disrespectful to my elders. I, I hope, hope I've kept that up. So that was the Jamaica that I grew up in. And then just about the time I left, we had independence. So when I speak about my adventures, those are the two periods of my experience as a Jamaican. And now I'm a Jamaican because I came to this great country and I started to experience the life of being a musician here in America. Well, I had a lot of serendipity along the way. And what I want to do now is, first, before I go into the, the main reason why I'm celebrating a special, special person in my life on here today, this December the 12th, is because one of my good colleagues from the Jamaica experience left us a couple of days ago. This was the, the great musician played the bass who personified how the bass should sound and be the rhythms that he gave us. His name was Robbie Shakespeare. And this is his partner, Sly Dunbar. So it was Sly and Robbie were the team. And I had the great honor of making an album with these two gentlemen. So we had did this album, Sly and Robbie, Monty Meets Sly and Robbie. So that was a great time and I miss I really miss having seen Sly and Robbie in quite a while. So sad to hear that Robbie has gone ahead, as we say. Well, I'm thinking of Jamaica, but I'm also thinking about when I first came to the USA and a most incredible thing happened to me. So as you may know, I am uh, celebrating December the 12th because today would have been the 106th birthday of a certain man, one of the biggest names in American music, Mr. Frank Sinatra. That's right, Mr. Frank Sinatra, who I got to know quite well because Mr. Sinatra heard me playing the piano in a little club and it was, the year was 1962. I was, I was still 18 years young and had no idea what was to come after that. I was in Miami, Florida. And um, lo and behold, Mr. Sinatra, Frank Sinatra, and his friends saw me playing the piano in Miami Beach. And that was the beginning of a series of events that led up to me receiving an invitation from Sinatra and his good friend, a man named Jilly Rizzo. Jilly had this terrific nightclub on 52nd Street in Manhattan. And Jilly is in the picture. There's Frank, and that's where I went to play. That's how I got to New York, and it happened all because of this overture from Francis, Francis Albert Sinatra. He heard me playing, and he must have dug it, and he said, hey, kid, you're swinging. I want you to come to New York and play there at my friend's club, Jilly's. And there I was for several years, and I played there. And um, today, December the 12th, is a very special. Every year, I think of Frank and all of the wonderful things he was about, his incredible music, his incredible performances on the screen, his incredible philanthropy, as he gave so much to so many people, people that he didn't know, he'd read something in the newspaper and he would just send money and send, if somebody was in the hospital and they needed to get 
to another location. He sent a helicopter. This was a real generous spirit in evidence. But in addition to that, Frank liked to have a good time. And this place, Gillies, was a favorite spot for him. He'd come into Gillies when he was in New York, let's say 12 midnight. There was Sinatra, right? And many a night, little old me, yes, I just turned 19. And there I am in this hotbed of excitement, the most thrilling stuff going on in New York City at that time. This is 1963. I'm barely, you know, what do I know, right? So the big thing I had to do was stay out of trouble because there was a lot of trouble, excitement and fun and foolishness. And I had the uh, good wisdom I remember from my Jamaica days. Now, before I continue that, out of respect for Mr. S, we used to call him. All these notes I made here, trying to remember to tell you good things. I'm going to put on my jacket. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm going to drink a toast to Frank. And behave myself. And this is a drink that looks like what he used to drink. He was a regular imbiber of a beverage called Jack Daniels. He would drink it with little water for the most part. And he'd have a few when he'd come in at 12 o'clock at Jillis, thereabouts. And I'd be playing the piano. And then I would alternate with another artist that would play, was playing at Jillis. And he'd be sitting at his table in the back of the room. And there was anybody from Count Basie himself, uh, Quincy Jones, uh, Judy Garland, John, Johnny Carson. All these people are there. Now, this is, this is this place where I'm playing the piano. It was a small club, seated about 70 people, full capacity. And it was um, the place to be. And there I was just a year and a half after I arrived in my America. Yes, let's say I'm just a green guy and here I am in, in an unbelievably exciting situation and I'm meeting all these great musicians who I would invite to come and play in with me when I was playing the piano. I'm playing the piano and I, I was fortunate to get um, all these terrific bass players and drummers to join me and we had a whale of a time because I was doing it right, let's put it that way. And... Um, among others, I remember Ron Carter came to play, Bob Cranshaw came to play, uh, Al Harewood came to play, Mickey Roca on the drums. All these great musicians came to play. That was Jillies. It wasn't a jazz club per se. It was a place where everybody wanted to swing in music. You, can, you couldn't go in there and play somber uh, ballads. Or, no, no, forget that. You got to come in there and do this thing that we call swinging. Swinging was in the air at the time, and it lasted for a long time until... People got really educated, and the educated people started to say, well, that's something my grandfather used to do. But I got to tell you this, folks, that stuff will never die because that's the heartbeat swinging, right? And I still love that aspect of our jazz music because I saw Louis Armstrong as a kid in Jamaica, and man, did I get excited. I saw Nat King Cole, and I heard Sinatra's recordings swinging like it. So anyhow in Le Bistro, this nightclub in Miami, first of all, a sip and a toast to the one and only Frank Sinatra on his 106th birthday, a man who made a big difference in my life before I knew about the, the jazz scene per se. I was just playing the piano and I was kicking up some dust, as they say. And um, I'm grateful to this, this man who was uh, the, the, the biggest guy in entertainment. That's it. Cheers to you, Mr. S. Thank you so much for all you did for little old me. And I'm going to try to remember some good incidents and share them with the good people who are listening to me right now. Here's a sip. Here's to you. Jack Daniels, four, F-A-U-X, four, okay. I put down my Jack Daniels. I want to tell you something that happened in about 19... Well, first of all, in 62, when I met Frank and friends uh, first, and he said, we got to get you to come to New York. And I'm just keep my mouth shut. I don't say much because I was ran, trying to learn that when my elders spoke, don't talk. Just be quiet. Well, nothing came of it because I would have to admit I was not the guy, the guy to pick up 
the, the opportunity right away and say, hey, you remember me? None of that. I just kind of humbly walked away and said, thank you very much and went back to my regular Miami life experience. Six months later, I would say, I received an invitation to go play in Las Vegas at the fantastic Thunderbird Hotel. The Thunderbird Hotel was where everybody in Las Vegas, that uh, when they got off of work at the other hotels, the Sands, the Riviera, the Desert Inn, the Sahara, all these great hotels that featured the biggest en entertainers. Um, I ended up, first of all, playing in Reno. Now I'm still just barely 19. And um, here I am in this other hotbed of excitement, which is what Las Vegas was then way more than it is now. I can assure you of that. Because color, I call them colorful folks, shady characters, the most beautiful ladies dancing in the places, the most colorful characters at the gambling tables. And here I am just off the boat from Jamaica. Okay? So I'm playing at the Thunderbird Hotel accompanying a singer guy named Johnny Bashman, after having been in the Mates Hotel in Reno, where I'm playing in Art Mooney's Orchestra. He had a big hit record 10 years before that. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover. That was Art Mooney's big hit. And he wanted me, he's heard me playing, and he wanted me in his band because I dug up some excitement, supposedly. So I'm at the Thunderbird Hotel, and lo and behold, in walks Sinatra and Jilly, and a couple of friends, and somebody said, hey, there's that guy again, that little guy, Monty, he's playing the piano, and, you know, I took, a, on the intermission, I, they called me over, and I saw them again, and they remembered me, I remembered them, and I said, so nice to see you, blah, 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 and then he says, we gotta get you to come to New York. This is the second time in six months, and lo and behold, some days later, I get a call and Jilly himself and I get an airline ticket to come to play the piano in New York City, the capital of excitement in the whole wide world, right? So that's not a happening. This is serendipity. This is magic. This is the most amazing thing for a guy who come from an island in the Caribbean, right? So that was the beginning of my relationship with Jilly and Mr. Frank Sinatra. And I have these reminders because there's so many terrific memories for me that um, years had gone by and I did a record because a sad happening took place when Jilly Rizzo himself, his life was taken in a terrible car accident and I was moved to make a recording. And the year may have been about, let's see, 1991 or something like that he his life was taken and it was in palm springs and i made this album and i sent the record to sinatra's home his office this is the cover that's the cover right there's great john patitucci playing the bass with me and troy davis and we went in the studio and john said to me what are we gonna play i said we're gonna play some an Italian American's music. Who's that? I said, Sinatra. And he had a big smile. And we went and just kept calling the tunes and we made the record. And some of the classics that we did it, we did it good. Let's put it that way. And I sent these records to the office of Sinatra. And would you believe? My mother called me up while I was in Europe and she said, I got a letter here. And it says, Frank Sinatra. I said, really? And she read it to me over the phone. This is a copy of the letter. And this is the actual letter. I thought I'd save that for posterity, something I'm very proud to have received from Frank. And he expressed his appreciation that I dedicated it to his good friend, Ginny. And here's this letter from Sinatra himself. And that's why, as I share these memories, there's such a lot of personal authentic awareness about all these incidents. So to move on, and I wrote some of these moments down, I'd be playing in a club in some town. For example, when I was in, you know what, 
I'm going to take a break and play a tune. All this right. is my trusty melodica. I play <laughs> little songs on it. Keeps me happy. And I go, you know, I play all kinds of songs. And I'm going to play a short version of a song called Strangers in the Night. <laughs> Just a moment of melodica strangers in the night. Can Thank I you, say friend. something? Yeah. The melodica look like bricks, and we do know that. It's just a light, <laughs> it's a lighting issue. I don't know what that is, but okay. he wasn't playing bricks, I swear. Okay. Well, anyhow, thank you for that tip. We will not do any more melodica uh, performance <laughs> right about now. So I was playing in Washington, D.C. at Blues Alley where incidentally I'm going to be playing at in about uh, a couple of weeks from now, uh, Christmas week, the 27th to the, the, 20, the 31st of December. And um, anyhow, this goes back to the early 70s. And one night when I was playing there, I looked up and here comes Sinatra and a party of people. He comes into the club with uh, one of the astronauts, I think he was Buzz Aldrin, or Eugene Cernan. It was Eugene Cernan, one of the astronauts that had just gone to the moon. He came in in the party. There was this lady that was the owner of the great racing horse Secretariat. He came in with uh, a few other people, and Jilly was there. And it was great that he came. And I went to my thing and I started playing. And in fact, I remember I was playing a ballad. Uh, I was playing uh, the summer of '42, and. I got the impression he was really listening to me because some people were talking in the audience and he didn't want, he wanted to hear the music. And he, in the middle of the performance, all I heard was, shut up. It was Sinatra telling these people to shut up. He, he wanted to hear the music. He wanted to hear me playing. So, hey, that's a flattering thing, right? Well, the night goes on and it's like 2 a.m. And Jilly came over to me and said, hey, um, we're in town and we want to get want to get some food. It's late at night. Is there a restaurant nearby? What do you do? You know the area? I said sure. There's a lot of places, and I I don't know what you want. You, you want to go to an Italian restaurant? You want to go to a Chinese restaurant? Where you want to go? So I go to the bartender and I ask him what's a good place to go. And then he said, Well, there's a great Italian restaurant, but it's several miles away, and um, it's called whatever. And I go back to Jilly and I say. This is the place you might want to consider going there. And Julie goes back to Frank. And Frank says, nah, I don't want to go there. It's too far. He says, let's go to the White Tower. White Tower, the hamburger joint, right? <laughs> so they're all dressed in tuxedos. And the ladies in gowns, they've gone to, they've been at the White House for some reception. And... Uh, three limousines and he's come on money and i get into the cadillac there i am so i said what what's going on here and we drive up about what three blocks to the white tower or the white castle these are these places that serve the little hamburgers delicious as ever and sinatra walks in and he's had a few now a few of these uh jack daniels right and he walks in and the little gentleman who is behind the 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 stove is flipping the burgers, what have you. There's nobody else in there. 
And Sinatra walks in and he's got about, I don't know, about seven other people piled in, including me. And he looks at the guy and says, the guy says, yes, sir, what can I help you? And Sinatra says, 50 burgers. 50 burgers, yeah. <laughs> and the guy goes at making 50 burgers. And sad to say, the gentleman forgot to put the pickles. Yes, he forgot to put the pickles in the burgers. And Frank, I got I got to, he didn't like that. For Frank, so I so, saw so frustration coming up in Mr. Sinatra, and I, I, I'll stop there because he, he, he made a remark. And um, the people were like, say, what's he going to do? Well, all I know is we all had our hamburgers, and then he said, where you staying, Manny? I said, well, I'm at this hotel down on 16th Street, not the best part of town. He says, we'll drop you off. And um, they took me to the Ambassador Hotel, which was on, I forgot the actual address, but that was one of those memorable times because she liked to stay out late at night. He was a night guy, you know? So I'm just remembering all these incidents. There was another time in Copenhagen. No, no, Amsterdam. So I'm in Amsterdam and I saw in the newspaper tonight at the Concertgebouw, Frank Sinatra. I hadn't been reading these Dutch newspapers because I don't speak the language. And But when just by happen chance, I saw an article and a and a and an ad tonight Frank Sinatra the concert about and I made my way I said I'm gonna go over there maybe I can see somebody and I can get in and sure enough it was sold out and um people the ladies with picket signs saying we love you Frank we love you blah 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 all that you know Frankie so I am this uh call it wide eyed kid wanting very much to see Jilly Sinatra and company and enjoy the show because when Sinatra got up on the stage, let me tell you folks, that was excitement unparalleled, especially in that period. This is like about 70, 76, 77, 78, when I was in Amsterdam and I'm feeling forlorn and a little regretful because I wanted to get a ticket. They were all sold out. So I go to the backstage to see if there were musicians coming in, you know, and I didn't see anybody, I didn't see, see anybody. And I finally turned around and I saw a guy with a bass fiddle and he's walking in the secret door. I said, aha, right? So I try to get through the door, but then the door is locked. I can't get in. So I'm a little disappointed. And I start to walk away saying, well, I tried. And as I walk away, I'm standing there. Here comes a light blue Mercedes Benz. I'm standing there. And pulls up right in front of me. The door opens, and out steps Jilly and Frank Sinatra and his wife Barbara. And I'm standing there, and they look at me, and they remember me. and says, "What are you doing here? What are you doing here, kid?" I said, "I'm here coming looking for you." He says, "Come with us," and they take me backstage with them. And I go backstage, and he's brought his orchestra and the musicians were mostly people from London. They, he flew them all over there to be his accompanist. And um, the show is about to start. And we go up into his dressing room. And I remember he, he ordered some soup, turtle soup. He said, hey, buddy, have some turtle soup. You know, so I'm there sitting tur having turtle soup with Frank and Jilly and Mrs. Sinatra. And uh, next thing you know is the, st the show starts. The downbeat with the band, and you never heard an excitement like that. The people going nuts out in the audience, and he does the show, and I'm sitting in, in a great seat, and um, finally the show ends, and the people are enraptured, and they're applauding, and Frank gets out, walks off the stage. They're applauding. The applause doesn't stop, and he goes right out the back door to the blue Mercedes. He gets into the Mercedes, and they're applauding still. He's driving off. And at that moment, he's going right to the airport. Get back in the plane and go back to London where he was staying at that time. So these, these might be boring stories for, for other people to hear. Say, why are you turning the story, man? You're talking too much, blah, blah. No, Somebody... no, somebody's saying you tell great stories. I'm looking some of the comments. Here. Really? Yeah. Well, I'm just remembering the best I can. And I wrote a few things. And um, indeed, you know, telling you about occasions when I ran into this guy, the one and only, who loved his music and um, was the, the most 
perfect performer, you know, as the years went by, needless to say, like happens to those of us who are who are at it for a long time, he started to slow down in his 80s. And um, it mattered so much. I was playing in Los Angeles and he saw an article in the calendar section of the Los Angeles Times. And uh, I got a phone call, you know, he, supposedly he, he wanted to invite me down to Palm Springs and that didn't work out on that occasion. Then there was a time I played at uh, a very special event up in Mount Kisco at Bennett Surf's home and the publisher, Mr. Bennett Surf, they were all friends and Sinatra came and Jilly came up to me and I was playing there. I remember Bob Cranshaw was on the bass and I'm just there to play some tunes. And Jilly said, how you doing? And he said, Frank wants to do a number. That's exactly what he said. Frank wants to do a number. I looked up, huh? what? What? <laughs> what number? What? Because, you know, I didn't say this much but I'm one of these rare kind of characters that I was not a student at school. I was the rebel, a good rebel. I didn't get into tr big trouble, but I would sneak out of school just to go play the piano back in Jamaica. And I did everything to avoid going to school. I consequently, I never really learned to read. I mean, you have to know how to read music, you know, but everything I did with music and that's everything was with this, my ear. I would hear the song, and if I got could wrap my psyche around it, I could play the song. Whether it was a pop tune, whether it was a jazz tune, whether it was a Jamaica tune, whether it was a blues tune, I seem to have all these these aspects to to be able to to play music, you know. And I never even thought of it as jazz. I just heard music. I loved it. when I heard pianists in the classical tradition perform and said, "Wow, listen to that the way they get a sound out of the piano." And to me, it was sound. So, folks. This is January, January, December the 12th, 2021. Sinatra would have been 106 today. And I can't forget Mr. Frank Sinatra and what he did for me, as well as what he did for so many others. And um, he made a big difference. He was a fighter for rights for people, uh, minorities, big time. He went into Vegas and he made sure that Sammy Davis Jr. and Nat King Cole and Lena Horn and all these wonderful, great artists of color didn't go through the kitchen door anymore, that they came through the front door because they were going to let, let these people that we admire go secondary. And Sinatra said, if you don't let them be treat, if you don't treat them like you're treating me and the other guys, I'm not performing here anymore. Sinatra spoke up for people. There's this incredible song he sang called The House I Live In. And it spoke to those people who were less respected, whether they were African-Americans, whether they were Jewish, whether they were from wherever. And Sinatra stepped up to defend them in every case. So here's a guy who lived on the edge. He did some drinking and he loved his music. It could be up to, I mean, the, the amount of nights I stayed up till 5 a.m. to keep entertaining and see him there with his friends that I would meet. That's where I met Mill Jackson and uh, Lockjaw Davis and, and Sonny Payne and all these great musicians who played uh, with him at times. I could go on and on, but I understand time is running out. I mean, nobody's going to, I think, I'm not going to pull the plug. But, you sure? Uh, <laughs> yes. That's the one and only Cat, Miss Cat, who is the co-pilot here, folks, and she's awesome lady. She's keeps me out of trouble, and she's uh, manning the equipment because between you and I, I can't figure out which end is up, which button to press, and um, yeah, we we have a certain age group. We come from the analog world when when they would cut the piece of tape with the music on it and splice it together to to make it sound good, right? Well, they don't do that anymore. Now they're just digital. And uh, I'm not very sharp. I don't think Sinatra would have been very good either at that, you know? So all this to say, thank you for listening. We had a little video we had queued up. Do you want to share that or oh, do you want to take some video. questions? Just as, we... as I said, you know, the songs of, of Sinatra and the other person that meant so much to so many of us was Nat King Cole. Nat. If you're a Jamaican, you said not King Cole. No, it's not 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 King Cole. It's Nat Nat King Cole, 
who I saw when I was 10 years old. And the songs that um, got into my heart that he had recorded. And then, of course, he, when he came to Jamaica, he played the piano like, forget it, you know. And um, I ended up being invited by Natalie Cole, Nat's daughter, to play on her very, very successful recording, Unforgettable, right? And I was there with Natalie, who passed away some years ago from kidney failure. She was a beautiful and lovely person. And um, her father's music is unforgettable. So between that and Frank, and I will not forget to say the third person who matters so much to me, who I also recorded with, Mr. Tony Bennett, who is still with us, tearing it up, singing up a storm, giving you the greatest goosebumps when he pours his heart and soul into a melody. And um, all these men made a difference to me because some of us, when we play, we may not remember exactly what the words are, but we have an idea. And some of us play those words. You play what those words are, are saying, basically, right? You know, if you're saying, you must remember this, a kiss is just a kiss, that's as, as, as time goes by. And you're playing this idea of a song where time is going by and there was a love relationship and you're painting the picture. And that's, that's how I get to play music because if I didn't have the sense of painting the picture, I couldn't play, you know? So between my beloved Jamaica, where I born and raised, you know, I came to America and I was trying to fit in and I must have done a fairly good job because they'd hear my accent and I know it's an awkward accent. It's not the typical accent. It's not from from uh, Chicago, it's not from Rochester, it's not from Miami, it's not from Alabama, it's not, no, it's a different one. But I've heard people say, you know, you sound like you're from Wales or, or Ireland, but no, Jamaican people, when we talk, we're talking kind of like this. The word them coming out in a free way. So Jamaican them, when we're talking, we just talk so. We're not trying to shape the words so it's all proper. And I remember going to the movies as a kid and seeing all these terrific people on the screen, the movie stars, you know, Victor Mature, Alan Ladd, uh, Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas. You know, I go home and go and look in the mirror and I say, I want to talk like that guy. And I started talking like this, you know. You want to talk like this, hey, pal, what did you say to me? I resent that. Take it back. I'm going to let you have it. Did you hear what I said? You know what I mean? So you put on this accent and people stop asking me where I was from because if they keep asking you where you're from it really can get on your nerves and they stopped asking me where I was from because I, I spoke a little more like this when I spoke like this stop people stop asking me where are you from but you're from where you from Puerto Rico where are you from uh uh Greek are you what are you because some of us look we they can't put you in a box <laughs> right I am a wondrous variety folks of all kinds of wonderful like like the fruits in the in the in the bowl, you know, the mango and the, and the, the oranges and the bananas. Well, I'm one of those people. I am proud to be a Jamaican. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to be a part of the human race. And being a musician has been the greatest gift. And today, December the twelfth, right about now, I think I've said enough. Hope I haven't bored you to death. And. Um, miss the note because his fingers got fat but that's it for now and as frank would say so long and uh shall we take them out with the video oh here's that concert from from uh stockholm some years ago and i chose to play one of mr sinatra's songs and i think it's i've got you under my skin yeah i think so here we go i'll add it see all right. Play some Frank Sinatra songs for you now. Can you hear that? 
that's with uh, Hassan Shakur and all, and um, Obed Calvert. We're playing in Stockholm, Sweden, in the very hall where they give the Nobel Peace Prize, if I'm not wrong. And um, this was a nice event. And uh, thought I'd share that. Can I be heard? Yes, somebody's asking to say something about late about Shakespeare, please. Although you said it already. Well, I'll say this right now. Robert Shakespeare, when he when he took took those photographs and he looked at Robbie, he looked like a menacing, ready to, you know, he had that look on his face. But he was a he was just a teddy bear. He was the gentlest, sweetest guy. And when he played the bass, he came with that level of roots to make up. And he's one of the people that put it on the map. He Truly was the great dub, dub bass player. And as a kid growing up, to me, the bass was crucial to this whole experience. And in Jamaican experience, in Jamaican experience, Robert Shakespeare was the king, along with uh, the guys that did Bob Marley and some others. But Robert really was number one. And sad, sad loss that he has passed away. And um, I wish the family of Robbie all the best and may they, may they um, grieve and get over the, the loss but, but remember how wonderful Robbie has been as a musician and um, I miss him very much. I hadn't seen him in a while. We were in Japan together with Sly, myself and uh, Ernest Riley, the great guitarist. It was quite a quartet and um, he played the right notes, let's put it that way. But he had this look on his face, like a tough guy. But he was the sweetest guy in the world. And um, he was very The video is playing. So the video is playing, I'm not hearing it right now. But I took this opportunity, someone suggested on this great day of December the 12th, that I would speak about Mr. Sinatra back that it would have been on his 106th birthday and when our heroes move on as we say in Jamaica we say God ahead, he went ahead, um, whoever these people are we honor them by saying something and this was my turn because more than anybody else in the music world of Sinatra made the biggest difference for me and um, a great example of how we make your music tell it well as well as you can. Just now I did a little goofing around with my melodic, but truthfully I'm supposed to be a piano player. That's it, it. So all I can say is, um, as he would have said in Italy, Arima Dirci, ciao, God bless. Thank you very much.